some noise. Uh, we have a great opportunity now uh, to hear from the President of the World Bank on this issue of scaling up nutrition and food security generally. Um, after, uh, I think we'll, we'll have a conversation with, um, with Bob Zellick and then um, maybe the last uh, 10 minutes of this session, uh, we'll hear from Andrew Mitchell, who is the UK Secretary of State for Development. And I just want to uh, talk a little bit to introduce that uh, video from Andrew Mitchell. And um, I think that'll be a good way to, to end this afternoon session because uh, we'll end it on the topic of money, how we're going to get the money to, uh, to do what we ought to do in the area of nutrition. Uh, we are really honored and grateful to have with us the president of the World Bank, Robert Zellick. Um, first, I want to just tell you who's here. I'll introduce them to you before I introduce you to them. Uh, these are nutrition leaders from all over the world, notably about 50 nutrition leaders from countries that have very high rates of child malnutrition. We're really delighted to have them here with us. And then there are also uh, faith-grounded leaders, uh, activist leaders in Bread for the World's network all over the country. These are people who care passionately about hungry, hunger. And um, I want to particularly note that there is a group of uh, African-American and Latino church leaders and another group of leaders of Christian women's organizations who are here specifically to learn more about scaling up nutrition a thousand days to be uh, advocates for what we now know can be done for malnourished kids uh, in their networks across the U.S. So we're a good group to talk to. And uh, what I want to say about um, Bob Zellick, he's got a very distinguished background, of course. He wouldn't be president of the World Bank if he weren't a really sharp person. Didn't have a lot, of, lot, lot to bring with him. But what I want to tell you about him is that I think uh, Bob Zellick and the World Bank have responded remarkably well to the sharp increase in world hunger that's happened over the last few years. Remarkably well. Um, I'm almost ashamed to say it. I, I really focused on the fact that hunger was increasing dramatically in the world because of Bob Zellick and Josette Sheeran at the World Food Program. Asma Latif at Bread for the World Institute was telling me this, but I don't think I really got it until, whoa, I was hearing it from the World Bank. Um, he called, he really helped to call the world's attention to the fact that soaring food prices uh, had driven up hunger in a very alarming, tragic way. And throughout the last years, has been on top of the situation, uh, sounding the alarm when that's appropriate, and also suggesting to the governments and the peoples of the world ways, practical ways that we can respond to this huge setback in the world's progress against hunger and poverty. He also moved quickly to mobilize the bank's own financial resources to invest more in the productivity of poor farmers in poor countries, other social protection programs, um, and then also uh, under his leadership, the World Bank has provided just outstanding uh, leadership for the world on the issue of scaling up nutrition. Uh, I just want to acknowledge two of his colleagues who are here Jürgen Vogel is uh, in charge of agriculture at the World Bank. And uh, Mira Shekhar is, has been a tremendous leader of the scaling up nutrition movement. Uh, so on this one, I know you take a lot of criticism, but on this one, I just think the World Bank has um, done a great job and I'm, I'm really grateful. So uh, Bob, tell us, tell us why is the World Bank why have you focused so much on food security and especially child nutrition? Well, um, uh, is this on? You are Andrew. on. Um, I'd be pleased to answer that, David, but uh, let, let me start myself by uh, thanking some people. I understand you had a chance to hear from David Nabarro. Uh, David 
plays a critical role at the UN. As many of you know, I know people come from some uh, variety of backgrounds here. UN has lots of different operational arms, but it's important to interconnect them together, and David's really done a heroic job on that. And I really thank many of the people who come from the developing world to come to share with us their insights about how to address this, because one of the things we learned at the World Bank the hard way is that if people in the countries don't own it, it won't happen. Uh, people can be well-intentioned, they can bring resources, but unless the local community feels it's theirs, you really won't uh, get the delivery. Uh, I wanna thank David uh, for his leadership. Um, he has a little bit of a joke there because he actually used to work at the bank many years ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a much better place than when I worked there. <laughs> and we were actually comparing a little bit about some church backgrounds too that uh, we discovered. But most of all, I wanna thank many of you who've taken uh, time and energy and resources uh, to come to Washington. And I understand you may have some visits with the Congress tomorrow. I may see you because I've got some congressional calls tomorrow too. And I just want to emphasize that your timing couldn't be better because uh, everybody is well aware that there are some pretty big budget and spending issues. And I'm sure you'll encounter this with members of Congress. It's very much in the forefront of their mind. And it's a very serious and fundamental topic. So I, I appreciate the fact that they're being um, very disciplined in terms of any uh, resource allocation. But what I, having been involved with international relations in different areas, economic, security, development, what I found is most important for members of Congress is to hear from people in their own communities. When I was a trade representative from 2001 to 2005, I used to sometimes try to go out to visit members of Congress in their districts. It was always much better than meeting them in Washington. But if you come from their communities and you can speak about the communities, you'll have a way of trying to at least open their eyes to a topic that frankly in America has cut across political party lines, cut across regional lines. As I'm sure many of you know, one of the major food nutrition programs is the McGovern Dole program so that uh, other than the fact that they're Midwesterners uh, like David and myself, uh, they cover a pretty big uh, part of the political spectrum. And I think particularly for those of you from church groups, your involvement is really uh, fundamental to this because um, sometimes in the United States, international relations has been the province of people who come simply from the business community or the national security community. And I've told leaders from both parties uh, that what I've been discovering, because I worked a lot with issues of Sudan and others over in different capacities, was that America's churches have an increasing interest in this topic. And for them to hear that from you is the most important thing. And then if we can combine it with a little bit of the message about the importance of investment in nutrition, uh, I hope it'll make your visits very worthwhile. And I hope you come back with some additional insights on it too to help all of us be more effective. So I just, before answering the questions, I wanted to uh, thank you for that. Um, David asked about our involvement. You know, in some ways, it's, it's intriguing to me how the development community could have lost sight of this because food is so fundamental. I mean, without food, you don't have health, you don't have life, people don't have energy, they don't have the opportunity to grow. So in the context of the G20 and other organization you might have heard about 20 major economies across the world, I tried to take the opportunity of some of the rising food prices to emphasize to President Sarkozy of France, who's the chairman, about the importance about putting food first this year, putting the food issues first. For us at the World Bank, um, we cover a wide range of activities, and what I find is that the food issues interconnect. It's always useful if you can try to make an opportunity for something. So it, obviously, a lot of poor people around the world, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, are involved in agriculture. So if we can take the production of food, smallholder agriculture, figure out how to expand incomes, one of the things our research has shown is that the effect as an anti-poverty device is about three times higher than any other investment in, in another sector, such as manufacturing or services. And it makes sense if you think about it, because people in rural areas are often poor, so if we can increase their incomes, it has a much more significant effect on anti-poverty. What I found, uh, something I learned over the past couple years, and I'm sure your discussions revealed, is interestingly enough, the agriculture and nutrition communities were not very well connected together. And so the other point of this that we're trying to uh, draw 
a greater sense of, of interconnection through the World Bank is the work on nutrition. And I'm sure you probably heard some of this in the earlier discussion, but you know, we now know from across the world that the negative nine months, the first two years, are the critical period. And we have data that shows in terms of human development, development of brains, earning power at, a, at later stages of life, education, uh, family income. Uh, we've done some of these uh, tests over time in a country uh, with different uh, groups, and the results are absolutely stunning. So if you think about cost effectiveness of an investment, early level nutrition is probably the best investment uh, that you can make. Now if you combine that with the fact that we've had rising food prices, um, then you get the reason why all this connects together. It can be helping on the agricultural side if we help all along the value chain from property rights to seeds to fertilizers to transport, but it's also absolutely fundamental to our human development efforts. And we can talk a little bit more about this, but one of the other things we're trying to work on with the countries that we try to serve is how they can interconnect this with their own programs, whether they be anti-poverty programs, whether they be health programs or education programs. So many of you, if, when you're talking about with Congress, you know, I, I find that many members of Congress recall school feeding. School feeding is a basic program that you know, many people in America have, have seen over the years. And uh, you know, while it had a mission at first to also provide some support to the agriculture community, particularly for poor communities, it was often the only meal that children could get, and it was also critical to their learning. Well, that experience is something that we in the World Food Program and others have tried to take around the world, but if you take the comment I just made about nutrition, that addresses children when they're in school. So then the question is, how do you build on that? For example, give food to take home, other things, so you can try to get that key period of the negative nine months uh, to two years. So I'll just close with this point. What I'm pleased that my colleagues at the bank and I were able to see was before there was a financial crisis, if you go back in 2007, 2008, you could start to see the rising food and fuel prices. And another phenomenon is we're seeing much closer interconnectivity of food and fuel prices. It's partly due to biofuels, but it's due to other reasons, other factors as well. And we started to actually draw some attention to that as a warning sign, in part based on an article that was in Lancet that was talked about the Millennium Development Goals and how the one of nutrition was the sort of underappreciated goal, even though it's connected to so many others. So in a way, one of the reasons why this partnership with Bread for the World and the people who have come here uh, from developing countries is important is we're all learning as we go. And we have to continue to bring back the feedback loops so we can do this better. But to me, in short, you know, it's fun. If, if we don't start out with healthy people able to learn in a, in a generation that's able to learn, then everything that you build on top of it is on sand. I've been really impressed by just the amount of money that the bank has invested in uh, increased investment in agriculture since the food crisis started in 2008. I think, I mean, it's not nearly enough. Um, and uh, industrialized countries as, as a group haven't put up the money that they said they were going to put up um, to invest in agriculture around the world. But I think that the, the increase in the bank's finance for agriculture in poor countries is the sing single biggest international increase uh, available to countries that are struggling um, with uh, to, to respond in a positive way to high food prices. And also in the area of, of nutrition, it's much smaller within the bank than what you're doing in agriculture, but it's big relative to what um, any of the other international institutions or the bilateral donors are doing. So do you have those numbers in your head? I know you have a lot of numbers. Do you have those numbers in your head, how much you've put into this? And then can you describe sort of what, what are you doing in agriculture and what are you doing yeah. in nutrition? Well, l let me, because people are going to have different degrees of familiarity at the bank, let me explain a little bit how we operate because it actually underscores the criticality of the role of civil society groups working in developing countries as well as developed countries. Um, we, uh, perhaps contrary to people's impressions, we don't really uh, just 
pick and target one area absent the decision of the client. So we're either making uh, very attractive loans because we can borrow at uh, very good rates, or for the 79 poorest countries, and many of the countries we're talking about here particularly are, are in what we call the IDA, the International Development Association, we give grants or no interest loans. And that money, uh, this IDA money, has to be replenished every three years. We get some flow back from long-term 40-year loans, um, but we put in money from some of the income we make, uh, and we get money from donor countries, including the United States and the Canada and European countries, which is very vital to this role. The IDA money is, is allocated to a country based on a question of its need and some of its performance. And so we, we don't go to a country and say, well, you should put this in nutrition. We share the information about the benefits of nutrition, education programs, infrastructure, and then they decide. And you can see this is where it's critically important for civil society groups in developing countries to help make this a priority and to connect it to the country's program. So we have been able to scale up our activities, but by and large, it's been from, uh, it has to be demand driven. Now, uh, there are different ways that we have been able to do this. When just on that, I, yeah. I mean, I'm impressed that also that many, a number of developing countries, just with their own resources, have moved much more quickly than the international communities moved. I, well, I yeah, I wanted to come to that, and that's where, again, all of your involvement is very important because uh, when you take the numbers for foreign assistance from us or bilateral aid or others, they're still quite modest compared to a country's own resources. And you know, keep in mind, even in the so-called middle-income countries, you still have about 75% uh, or 70% of the people living under $2 a day. So even uh, Brazil's or India's, I mean, the, the child malnutrition rates in India are 40, 45 percent. So countries that you might read in the newspapers and you know, having very good businesses, that may be true, but there can be great diversity and there's still a lot of people that are in need. Now, in some of these countries, the challenge is how do we take the knowledge and learning from one country and share it with another country so with their own resources, not with aid or with, with our uh, contributions, you make a difference. And I, I wanted to come back to this, but I was just, um, last week I was meeting some of our European donors, but the week before that I was in Brazil. And you may know Brazil as a country has a program called Bolsa Familia, and it's like the program that Mexico has called Opportunatus, and they're called conditional cash transfer programs. And what they have done is they focus the, uh, a cash payment on the poorest families, but the conditions are it varies by country, but in Mexico and Brazil, it's basically you have to send your child to school and you have to get basic health care checkups. So in Mexico, it's probably done more for women's health than anything in the history of the country. Now, Bolsa Familia has been fantastically successful in driving down the overall poverty rate. But there's still, Brazil's a big country, there's still 16 million people living in extreme poverty in Brazil. And one of the reasons I was there was the president of Brazil was launching an effort to try to get at that next category. But I, I use this as an example because it gives you a sense of part of the role of the bank, but also how we learn from the interaction with civil society groups because in this Bolsa Familiar program or Opportunatus program often, and in, in particularly in countries with weaker infrastructure, the civil society groups are part of the distribution network. They're part of the support network. But let, let me just jump to North Africa. You've all been reading about what's going on in Egypt and Tunisia and, and uh, across the region, Libya, Syria. Um, in many of those countries that also have poverty and sometimes face difficult problems with high food prices because Egypt's one of the biggest wheat importer, their traditional way of dealing with this has been to increase uh, the subsidies for, in, in Egypt, about 85% of the people get a bread subsidy and it's so cheap that people, in a sense, now feed it to, to livestock. So it's not very targeted. Or they increase wages for everybody. So we're trying to work with these countries to learn from the Bolsa Familia programs or the Opportunatus programs, because those programs for about a half of 1% of GDP, which is pretty effective, are managed to have maybe 25 or 30% of their people get some support. And it's often then takes some of the lessons we're learning about 
fortification and nutrients in the food, so it's not just food, but it's healthy food. And you build an institutional platform that is not just dealing with health or education or income support or food, but interconnects them, and that has an efficiency of its own. So it partly gets you a sense that what we do is that the bank, part of our problem I sometimes tease people is because we're called bank, people think our main role is putting out money. But our real main role is being a catalyst in sharing knowledge and information and experience and then trying to connect financial resources to it. So to try to come back to your question, David, when we saw the food prices starting to rise and energy prices, I was worried that um, our traditional procedures of working with countries for loans would be a little too slow. So first we created a uh, food crisis response program where I took about $200 million we had from additional income, and then we used our basic lending, but we asked our board to give us freedom to move more quickly. And we really tried to target for whatever countries would need. For some, it was fertilizer. For some, it was seeds. For some, it was for working in partnership with UNICEF or the World Food Program on a school feeding program. And so it was some lessons we learned about uh, implementation with fast execution. So that was one operation. Um, second, as you mentioned, we tried to work with the G8 on a uh, program to support developing countries that come up with their own uh, development of their agricultural programs. And there is about $975 million committed to this, and we work as the trustee and work with the countries to try to find what the missing links are. So just to share with you another interesting story, at our spring meeting in April, I had the Rwandan agriculture minister with me at a food event. And she was saying how quickly the challenges had changed. And you can see this is one of the requirements it puts on all of this in the international system. You have to be close to your client. And she explained that the food crisis program we had uh, a couple years ago when food prices went up played some critical role in providing um, some inputs. I think it was fertilizers or seed. Um, but now, uh, frankly, they're moving on to the issues of trying to build some of the uh, the next was sort of the terracing because it's a very mountainous land and they could have with additional infrastructure investments in terracing be able to increase the productivity. And they'd actually increase the productivity I think three or four times incomes had risen and now the problem in Rwanda was one of storage facilities. And that as you may know many sub-Saharan African countries lose 50 to 60 percent of their food on the way to market. So transport or storage. So we whether through IFC, our private sector arm, or working with the governments, try to create what you are common and seen in the US or North America, which is silos or storage facilities. So the nature of the challenge changes. Now, uh, a, a third aspect is our own lending programs. And probably the biggest contribution is we're scaling up from about a $4 billion investment in agricultural year to a six to $8 billion agricultural investment a year. Um, and that includes as I mentioned, we, we not only try to do this through the government, but we have a private sector arm, IFC, that is looking country by country using this value chain approach and saying, well, where is it missing? Is it in the storage? Is it in the fertilizer? Is it in the credit facilities? So we can try to uh, uh, f uh, fill the gaps. And then in the nutrition area, uh, this is where our, the sun, the scaling up nutrition is critical because, again, always recall this won't work unless the local country owns it. So now we have some partner countries, and each of them are developing their own plans, and now we're trying to get the funding for that. And we provide some of the funding, we're talking with bilaterals for funding, and that's where the work that many of you do in countries uh, is critically important. So there are different ways that we can uh, try to, to tap uh, different activities with this, and, but it all also comes back to the idea that no country wants to stay in a state of dependency. So the, the long-term idea here is what can you do to try to help countries so they invest their own money to be able to feed and have healthy populations. I, I heard the Minister of Agriculture from Rwanda speak. Somebody mentioned that there was a big conference in Delhi on agriculture and nutrition. I got to hear her speak then, and then I was at this World Bank uh, affair that you mentioned, and she spoke. She is just, she is spectacular, this um, agriculture minister. What's so clear about her is that she's very effective and they're serious about overcoming hunger in the country. And it's also experimental. So they, they've you know, invested in agriculture, they've managed to 
make sure that every district, I don't know what the districts are called in the country, but every district has enough food. But then she said, we still found that within those districts, even though there was enough food in the district, that, um, just a minute, that uh, some people were hungry. So then I think uh, you'd, you'd know, Jurgen, but I think then they gave a cow. So one cow, one family, what's the slogan? Something like that. So if a, a, for really poor families, they gave them a cow so they could give milk to their kids. Um, so it's just been step by step. Um, in this very, very poor country, um, in fact, making progress on food security and nutrition. Excuse me, I'm, I got too excited and this mic is moving around. <laughs> um, on, you talked about what you were doing on nutrition. So uh, do you remember how much, how much money are you putting into freestanding nutrition projects? And then since the bank is involved in so many different aspects of development, are you able to to integrate the insights from scaling up nutrition into activities in agriculture or social protection projects or other kinds of, you mentioned education, are you able to, to approach nutrition through those other sectors? Um, well, we have um, about, can you hear me okay? I had the same problem, I, it was loose, okay. Um, we have about a half a billion dollars committed to uh, nutrition and we're looking with programs for about another half billion to get up to a billion over the next couple years. Um, but a lot of this traces back to what mm. um, the clients want. And so it comes actually back to um, the message that we develop with countries and frankly if we can leverage it with bilateral funding from the United States or Britain or Ireland or uh, the Nordics or others, Australia, uh, Canada who have been very generous, uh, this, this can help us make it go a lot further as well as with their uh, local funding. But when you asked about the programs, uh, again, the key message is we have to adjust with the circumstances. So I talked about these conditional cash transfer programs. We've now uh, expanded these, worked with countries to expand them to maybe 40 countries around the world or even a little bit more. But for the poorest countries, the, the capacity doesn't really exist to develop the registers of people and to be able to handle the delivery. Uh, and, and even the systems to know whether the children go to school or people get the health checkup. So we want to work towards that. But in the meantime, you look for other platforms. And I think this is again where we're uh, continuing to s experiment. And in fact, one of the other ideas we launched is we, we have a very small uh, development grant fund that we use to try to support people who bring us ideas for pilots. And many of these actually connect with civil society groups in the field. We have a competition for some of these ideas. But one of the ones we work basically, and this is where we worked with a lot of the UN partners, is in many countries around the world, just as in the United States, the school is the locus of a community. And so the starting point is to have those school feeding programs, which will help make sure that children will go to school because it may be the way they get fed. It may help make sure that their awakened school because if you don't have a meal it's pretty hard to pay attention in school. And then the question is can you then start to connect it with other things? So I mentioned uh, some experiments with making as an incentive for people to send their children to school to have another bag of food that might be taken home for a younger brother or sister uh, or uh, for the parents. So these are the types of areas that people are trying to learn and experiment. Now. Another critical area, and uh, you mentioned the World Food Program, they and UNICEF have been doing a lot of great work on this, um, is what we're learning about micronutrients. And so there's huge advances that can be achieved in not just providing food, but providing, providing nutritious food. And this is where you want to try to connect into uh, research that's going on. Um, and so there have been a number of companies that have been very cooperative and helpful in this. We're always looking at it from the development perspective. So we'd also like to see whether some of these companies might be able to set up operations in some developing countries. Some of the developing countries develop their own formula so as to be able to make the production. So I know in the World Food Program, one of their ideas, which I think is a great one, is the more food that they can source from developing countries for countries in need, you, you get a, a double benefit. You, you meet those in need, but you also are trying to uh, increase demand and they can even 
we're experimenting with them in some places, they've done this in East Africa, where if they know they're going to need a certain amount of food for some use, that uh, they be able to have a tender, uh, that they can assure small farmers, if you produce it, we'll buy it for this price, which is very important for a small farmer. Now, to do this, you have to make sure that you get cash uh, as your source of operations. And many of you know, uh, for many countries, including the U.S., the World Food Program's source of support was in commodity because that helped farm groups. Now, most countries, including Britain, did this, Canada did this, and the U.S., I think, is starting to do this, or is moving to some cash freedom, which, which would help you get the double benefit of those programs. So there's uh, an ongoing process of trying to learn. At the same time, the idea is building local capacity. So another aspect of this, whether it's a conditional cash transfer or school feeding or other types of nutrition program, is sometimes governments don't have uh, the capability to do the distribution or do the measurement or know who's getting the results. So what we're trying to do at the same time as we're trying to meet today's nutrition needs is trying to build some of the capabilities uh, that can go along with it. So I think one of the, ch the challenges in the field of development or uh, humanitarian efforts is um, people often specialize in sectors. They specialize in health, they specialize in education, they specialize in nutrition, they specialize in agriculture. But as all of you know, people don't fall into sectors. People fall, uh, they're, they're, they're across groups. So how do you interconnect, uh, the way I used to say it is, how do you make sure that you interconnect the dots together? And how do you make sure that government programs efficiently help with people's multiple needs? Now, this can become an upward spiral or a downward spiral. I mean, one reason that I focused on nutrition early in my tenure was the data were rather stark about the fact that if you had poor nutrition, you're going to have poor health, you're going to have poor education outcomes, you're going to have poor earning possibilities. So if we get the fundamentals right, and particularly in the early stages, and this is a critical period is obviously the periods of pregnancy and the prenatal care, uh, this is a, is a core issue for uh, the development of individuals and countries. So part of the challenge, and this is where we work with partners, while we're, we're in 130 countries around the world, but obviously the learning exercise comes from local partners, CSO groups, UN groups, church groups. So part of what we've been trying to do as an institution, Dave, and it's one reason I think you've seen us expand our partnership, we have interaction here as well, is to try to say, look, we can learn from others, and in some cases, they become the critical delivery agents. I mean, let me just give you one other example. A lot of you read in the newspaper about Afghanistan. Um, and you read, actually, you read the stories about aid in Afghanistan. Uh, the World Bank has tried to take a slightly different approach than the U.S. bilaterally and others. And we've realized that we want to build the capacity in Afghanistan to manage its future. And so just to give you a sense, I, I don't hold me with the precise numbers, but I think only about a third of the funds that go to Afghanistan actually go through the government and its budget. Now, uh, this means that the problem, the challenge of owning something is going to be much harder uh, if, if a government doesn't even you know, control two-thirds of the funds that are going to take care of its people. Now, there's a reason for this, and it's, I mean, it wasn't that people are evil or stupid, it's that they wanted to do some things in the field and the government didn't have the capacity. And so what do they do? Wait for four years to build or five years or ten years? But what we've tried to do, and I, I mean, this is one reason I mentioned the civil society groups, is in the area of health, for example, some of you might have read there's been some very successful basic preventive health care across Afghanistan. Well, we worked with the health ministry to design that program, and it's basically executed through NGOs and civil society groups, both Afghan and international, doing the operations in the field. So it goes through the government's budget, the health ministry manages it, but they didn't have the staff to execute it, so civil society groups become contractors or partners. So these are the types of um, interconnecting and blurring of the lines that we need to know about as an institution so that when we counsel governments, we can help connect them. And just to give you a sense of reinforcement for what you've been involved with, the, the, the effects when it starts to work are startling. So the data we have from a country like Senegal, or I mentioned Brazil, uh, Ethiopia, uh, still a very, very poor country. Ethiopia is large and it still has some very, it still needs to import food and get humanitarian food aid, but the targeted nutrition efforts have had a huge difference that is now measurable. 
I'm going to give other people a chance to ask, uh, to ask questions. This is a note says, remember to let the audience ask some questions. <laughs> <laughs> Before I... <laughs> but you were ahead of it. <laughs> the session ends at, at 55 after, right? Okay. So uh, we'll go with you until about uh, 2.45 and then have the video. But before, before we go to questions, I want to ask uh, one more, and that is, um, this is a pretty much a civil society crowd. So there are NGOs from the USA, from Europe, from... Uh, the early riser countries from many developing countries. There, uh, there's the, the, the grassroots leadership of Bread for the World. Uh, so from all over the world, we're mostly civil society. So what do you want us to do to help scale up nutrition? Well, first, I, I really am sincere about thanking you for this interest. I mean, as you can even tell in the short conversation and you probably heard during the course of the day, there's so many things in are connected to this. It's, it's, it's sad to think about any child trying to go home at night and not having a meal or being hungry, and that's bad enough. But when you think that that could stop a child's ability to learn, to be a productive member of a family, uh, to have a chance in life, then it even gets much more important. So the thanks are to you. And I, what I guess what I would say, and I think this is what one reason these types of meetings are very important. There's lots of interconnections here. We haven't yet mentioned the criticality of agricultural research. So one of the other things that the bank supports is uh, there's a group of centers called the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research. They're all around the world. And we try to coordinate them with donors to focus on some of the emerging challenges, whether they're related to climate change or forest-based agriculture or drought-resistant crops or others so that people have research targets. Um, and this is interesting, someone like Prime Minister Singh of India, whose early work in economics benefited from some of the Green Revolution, is very keenly supportive of this. Many of you will have heard of Norman Borlaug, who uh, won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize for his agriculture research, and now there's a food prize named after him that's awarded in Iowa in, in, uh, in the autumn. So it ranges from that. We've heard about that. <laughs> uh, uh, to, to uh, I have to say, just I, I, I went to the, the, the World Food Prize a couple years ago, and I hope to go again this year. For all those of you that have a chance, it's a great event. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's wonderful. This does reveal, we're having a Midwestern thing here, because he's from Nebraska <laughs> and I don't know. But it, is, it gives, it's a wonderful sense of, Jürgen, who's from Germany and a head of our agriculture, came with me, and I said, you're going to really see America now. We're kind of getting out <laughs> from the coast, and it's a wonderful event. Um, but, uh, and I might say it's even run by a former Foreign Service officer. It shows yeah. the international connection who I used to work with. Um, uh, Ken Quinn. Uh, but, the, but, but I think um, what I was trying to touch on was you may be interested in school feeding. You may be interested in the, in the agriculture research. You may be interested in humanitarian support in emergency situations. You may be interested in agriculture. Uh, there's l it's important to see how those pieces are interconnected, which I think a meeting like this helps show you. But then, frankly, the main thing that you can do is tell the story to people who help make some of the decisions, either within developing countries or in developed countries for support. But there's one other aspect of this that's also important, in that the only way we can sustain these programs is if we show results and show that they work. So the other key point, particularly for those of you that operate programs in developing countries or from developing countries, is to help us gather the information to make them work better. This isn't just a question of spending money. It's a question of putting money to good use. And you know, I can't think of any activity in human endeavor where you can't learn something about how to do it better. So there's lessons here to be learned about uh, improvement on the ground but I would say, if I could, with a, uh, a slight near-term preoccupation, if you're going up to Congress tomorrow, uh, tell people some of the stories of what you've heard and how important it is. Because I can assure you, having worked with the US Congress uh, since the 1980s, 
your members of Congress get besieged by all sorts of requests, and there's all sorts of groups that want their attention. But if you come from the, from the district and the constituency, you do get a special hearing because you're a voter. And what you say and what your neighborhood says matters to them, or what your church group says matters to them. So take the opportunity you have to go participate in the democratic political process and whatever party interests you most, urge them to pay attention to this because uh, when I look at the overall international assistance funding, it looks like it's gonna get cut pretty badly. Um, and um, I looked at the numbers for McGovern Dole and the Food for Peace and some of the other numbers and they're all being stretched as is the World Bank funding. And frankly, you can understand it at a time that a country is suffering and you got unemployment, most members of Congress say, look, I gotta take care of people at home first. So it's very important for you to say, look, don't quite have such a narrow view because if we don't end up having growth and healthy people around the world, frankly, you're gonna have problems back in the United States too. Remember, we only got about four to five percent of the people. Um, if you're gonna wanna sell goods abroad, if you're gonna wanna have opportunities, if you wanna avoid conflicts and strife and breakdown in societies, it's, it's a sensible investment, and as I've said, nutrition is the most sensible. Thank you. A couple questions. We'll start over here. Hi, uh, Lloyd Schmeidler from Durham, North Carolina. Uh, having been born, born and raised in Kansas, it's great to see some Midwesterners here in D.C. <laughs> taking the lead. What, you, what got you to North Carolina? <laughs> uh, <laughs> there are good people in North Carolina. Um, I just want to know how you got there. <laughs> as, as we joke, it's good to be from Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> Against, nothing against uh, Midwesterners who are, who are uh, with us here. Um, I wanted to get a, a little better sense of uh, agricultural development. Uh, some of us uh, are concerned about pet petrochemical-based agriculture as it's practiced in this country, and uh, um, I'd like to hear more about uh, what, what models for increasing production uh, we're using around the world, because I hope we're not simply trying to, uh, to do more with petrochemicals as uh, is used heavily in, uh, in this country and so much of our agriculture. So I wanted to hear more about how we're in increasing production and, and also that, that we're not simply, uh, we know the world is becoming increasingly urbanized and so there's a concern about are we are we going to with increasing production? Are are we also driving uh, people from the rural areas to the cities, uh, with, which which also creates a, a lot of um, uh, pressure on on urban development and, and urban systems? And so, are, are there efforts going on to uh, help people stay in the rural areas and develop the rural areas? Okay, well. Um, to just to take two of those pieces and connect them from the start. Obviously, you're, you're right, there's a very fast urbanization. And uh, it's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa as well as all across East Asia and all the developing world. But it happens for a reason, which is that people see the opportunities. I mean, you, we jokingly talked about Kansas to North Carolina. You obviously saw it moved uh, from Kansas to North Carolina because you saw an opportunity. So the starting point is, the more we can create opportunities in rural and agricultural areas, the more likely it is that people will find it in their interest to stay at the same time that we hopefully can increase their income by increasing agricultural production. Now, it really varies by country enormously. And I've referred to this value chain, and, but let me just take a little bit extra moment on it. For some countries, if you don't own your land, or let's say in Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of women are the agriculturalists, they may not have rights to property of the land, then you're probably not gonna invest in the land. You're not probably not gonna put in irrigation, you're not gonna do things that will make the land more productive uh, over time. So property rights are very important. Um, second, I talked about seeds. Again, these are rough recollections. In, in South Asia, about 40% of the seeds are enhanced. I'm not necessarily talking about biotech, although I think biotech has a very important role too. These are just enhanced seed varieties, things that have come from research over the course of decades. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's probably about 5%. So partly just by having enhanced seed varieties, uh, you can do better. 
I would add to that, as we're starting to see difference in drought conditions and other water conditions, the more we can learn about seeds that will be more productive in different environments, that's a plus. Uh, a third aspect, and this connects with uh, something we're trying to work on in the climate change area, um, soil carbon. We, it again varies by country, but we estimate that about 30 to 70 percent of carbon has uh, it's been lost from the soil over the past two centuries. So I grew up in Illinois. I was used to very thick, dark, black soil. You go to many other places, you don't have carbon in the soil. You can see the difference in its appearance. There actually are some interesting opportunities here to create incentives to put more carbon in the soil, which helps deal with climate change, as well as make better soil. So what can we show and teach people, and how might we use some of these climate change systems maybe to pay people to do this, just like one does with avoided deforestation? Irrigation systems, fertilizer systems. Now, and irrigation is another very important area. You know, in many parts of the world, you're seeing uh, a lot of problems with shortage of water. Water is probably one of the other critical issues for development. And one of the uh, issues is we've learned an awful lot. Israel actually is one of the leaders in this, but others have of sort of drip agriculture. How can you can use water uh, more effectively and efficiently? Um, and so all along the process, including this critical element of infrastructure, because one of the things that we're learning in sub-Saharan Africa is probably one of the biggest gaps is the question of roads to get the product to market um, and storage facilities. So not surprisingly, farmers have a harvest season. All this appears on the market at one point. It can depress the prices. So if you have silos or some storage facilities, you can actually manage that. And using things like basic cellular communications, now you can get better information about prices, uh, whether it be of food products or, or uh, other types of commodities or fishery or other activities. So how can we use some of the advances in for information technology? So it really varies a lot by country. Um, you, you mentioned petrochemicals in particular. I think part of this relates to fertilizers. Um, and obviously, from an environmentally and sustainable agricultural point of view, people are looking to try to see how to do this most effectively. I would just point out that probably when I think of energy and agriculture, <coughs> The linkage that jumps to my mind most is uh, the corn-based biofuels in the United States. Where, as I mentioned, over the past decade, when energy prices went up maybe 10 years ago, again, these are rough numbers, you might have seen a 20 to 30 percent effect on food prices. Now you're seeing about an 80 to 90 percent effect. It's partly biofuels. It's partly the use of energy for fertilizer and transport. Um, but it means that when you have events like we've had in the past year that bump up oil prices, you've got to expect that food prices are likely to be uh, interconnected. So well, again, what it, I guess if there's one other message that I can relay to you, in a way, one thing that uh, at meetings like this I think could be very helpful is obviously you can't solve all these problems at once. So you've got to focus on the ones where you really care about and you can make a difference. But it's good to see the interconnections too, uh, and, and including the one that you mentioned. Okay. Over here. Uh, my name is Chilufia William from Zambia. Uh, first of all, let me take this rare opportunity to thank the bank for its effort in ensuring that um, uh, developing countries like ours have uh, the Freedom of uh, Information Act enacted in parliament. I think those are um, such very good efforts that as civil society, we need to ensure that we work smoothly. Uh, my question is, uh, are you working with civil society on uh, nutrition issues? If so, how? Thank well, for, you. Well, thank you. Uh, I was actually just in Zambia um, December, I think. Uh, I get around a lot. <laughs> but, but, and uh, for those of you that, that aren't familiar with it, uh, it's a country of huge agricultural potential. It's, it's a very, very, very rich land. It's also got a lot of mineral wealth. Um, and I want to touch on that because of the larger point you made about freedom of information. Um, I talked about governance and, and kind of broadening out to different groups and political participation, civil society. One of the things we're trying to do at the bank is both on our own aspects, uh, open up for information, but also uh, encourage governments to do so. And if you think about this issue of sort of continuous learning, and having civil society engage with governments, the best thing we could do is kind of open the process so people can see what's out there and what works and what doesn't. And I should have mentioned this, but if you, if you have an interest on our 
bank website, um, we've been working with some people from Google so that you can find whatever country interests you and call it up and we will have all the individual project sites on a geo map and you can just point and look at the individual project. We're going to have them for, we have them for the Ida countries up now and for all countries by the end of the year. So it's our way of also uh, trying to make it closer to home and just to connect it to civil society a little bit more. It won't be too long before we have the functionality so that in addition to being able to push a put your finger on, on a site and be able to get the information about it, that I'd like to build in interactivity. So we could have people in the community report to say, well, so-and-so is stealing the food, or this isn't working, or you might do this, or this, or this. So we can make it a, a live interconnection. And so I, I just mentioned this. It's a little, may seem a little sporadic, but uh, there are some huge opportunities to use technology to engage in developing countries, just like in developed countries, and to engage civil society and communities. And all this goes back to the basic theme that I mentioned, which is the more people own it, the more likely it is to go right. And it's, if it's governments or the World Bank or somebody else coming and imposing on you, you're not going to get uh, the real story. So going to your point about civil society, we're an international agency. I can't tell governments what to do. But what we're trying to do is share the experience about how engagement with the civil society leads to better products, how it leads to better service. And ultimately, for politicians, it leads to more content publics because they feel that they're part of the participation and process. One of the things that I suggested in a speech in April was to see if our shareholders, which are uh, 189 government, 87 governments, are would give us a little bit more freedom so we could do some more particular financing for civil society groups. What we have today is, um, as I alluded to, we can try to build it into the project, as in the delivery in Afghanistan, and so the governments can, but that requires the government to go along with it. I have some very small grant facilities like this, this development grant fund where we can do some experiments. I, I would like to be able to have a little bit more freedom to be able to help develop civil society groups, whether it be on service delivery or accountability and good governance. And I realize we need to be open and transparent about this. I'm not trying to interfere with political processes, but it's all based on the concept that you suggested and that many of the people here represent, which is that an engaged and enlightened society is, is good for governance. When uh, Mr. Zellick was coming in, he told me he grew up a Lutheran. We lost it. I'm a Lutheran pastor. And I was sad to hear that we lost him somewhere along the way. <laughs> <laughs> My mother's going to be very upset about that. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, in this room there, people have all different kinds of ideas about God or not God. But I think just everybody knows that uh, providing nourishment to hungry kids is sacred work. And... Uh, we just are really grateful for your public service and especially for your leadership in scaling up nutrition. Please join me in welcoming, in, in, in saying thank you to Bob Zellick. You gotta get out of here so we can. Thanks a lot. You can just, you can do that later. Yeah, you can just go down this way. Well, thank you, David. Thank you very much. My mother, she's Keep watching. applauding while he's leaving the stage. <laughs> while they're unwiring him, I'm going to go ahead and uh, so that we can hit the deadline here. Uh, we're going to hear. Um, a video message from Andrew Mitchell, who is the UK Secretary of State for Development. But in introducing that, I think it would be helpful for me just to, in six sentences, summarize the main ideas in scaling up nutrition. The green paper out on the tables is the framework paper. You can also get it by Googling scaling up nutrition. And there are really just six ideas. So one is focus on babies and pregnant women. Two is teach low-income parents good nutrition practices like breastfeeding and washing your hands with soap. That's very powerful. 
The third idea is to get key micronutrients to those babies and pregnant women. So it's especially iodine, A, zinc, iron. You can get them into the food supply. Uh, a fourth thing is to have community-based systems that identify severely undernourished you can, kids. You can spot them because of weight, weight failure to gain weight, and then get them fortified foods, things like Plumpy Nut that can save their lives. The fifth thing is to integrate nutrition insights into agriculture and other, and health, into the, uh, the big sectors. And then the final thing is let local pe people figure out how to do it locally, because they, they know what's going on in the country. Those are the six ideas. And then what, what the Scaling Up Nutrition Plan is, is a roughly $10 billion a year plan that would implement those ideas in the 36 countries that have the most malnourished kids. So if we could, if we could get that mobilized, all the technical agencies that put, put it together said, we, we would probably uh, keep a million children a year from dying, and many millions of children a year would be saved from the debilitation that comes from malnutrition, and then you go ahead and live. That's the idea. Now, there's one big problem is getting the money. Where are we going to get the $10 billion a year? Uh, some of it in that paper, they say, well, maybe half of it could come from the developing countries themselves, half of it from the industrialized countries. So far, it's not clear where that money's coming from. Some of the, the bank and the US and Canada and UK and Ireland are doing some things, but nothing on the scale that's anticipated in the Scaling Up Nutrition Program. So what's really exciting about Andrew Mitchell is that the, United, the current government in the United Kingdom is a conservative, gov primarily conservative government led by a conservative prime minister, and they are doing budget cuts, by uh, very deep budget cuts um, for the, on all kinds of things domestically. But at the same time, they are increasing their international development assistance. Uh, and Andrew Mitchell is playing a big part in that, so he actually has money to spend, and the UK is deeply committed to scaling up nutrition. So it's important for us to hear from Andrew Mitchell. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you to David Beckman and Tom Arnold for their kind invitation to contribute to this event. I feel a great personal commitment to the subject of undernutrition. I wanted to be with you in person, but unfortunately couldn't because of the Gavi event that is taking place here in London today. The scale of the problem and the impact of undernutrition cannot be overstated. Undernutrition affects 195 million children globally. That's one in three children. Millions of children are failing to thrive because physically and intellectually they are more susceptible to disease and at greater risk of dying because of poor nutrition. The first thousand days of a child's life is critical. It builds the foundation for better lives for poor people. Good nutrition helps ensure our other development investments succeed. Evidence shows we can do something about it. I met a baby girl called Mahima in the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh last year, and she was just half the weight of an average 18-month-old British girl. Near two-thirds of children under three in her region are malnourished. Madhya Pradesh has the same population as the UK, but an economy that is 100 times smaller. The Indian government is taking this seriously, and we are working closely with them, because together we can save lives. With British support, Madhya Pradesh will ensure that undernourished children like Mahima will be appropriately fed, immunized, given vitamin supplements, and provided prompt health services when they have diarrhea. The British government is also proud to be a donor partner in the Scaling Up Nutrition initiative with the European Commission, Irish Aid, USAID, the World Bank, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as others. 
I am delighted that the UK is the donor convener in Zambia, working closely with UNICEF, and we are actively working with other early riser countries like Bangladesh and Nepal. What are we doing? We're supporting direct interventions, for example, increasing the uptake of vitamins and minerals and promoting good nutritional practices, addressing the underlying causes, poverty, food insecurity, and the lack of power and status of women and girls, poor water and sanitation and education. Of course, it's the responsibility of national governments to show leadership and commitment. But we know that countries which have successfully tackled malnutrition have done so with a strong civil society movement that can hold governments to account for their commitments. Civil society organizations in early riser countries have a vital role to play in sum. So I urge you to grasp the immense challenge to work together, to call on governments to scale up their nutrition actions, put in place strong leadership for this effort, and work with all stakeholders to deliver improved nutrition for the world's most vulnerable. Thank you.